I, I promised at the end of last time, I kind of went a little quick at the end. I said, well, we should do another example for implicit differentiation. It's a nice idea. Now you might say, I learned implicit differentiation back in Calc 1. Is there any similarity? Are they, are they similar in the way that they, they approach the topic? And the answer is, it's the exact same ideas. So that makes everything really simple. All right, so if you're like, wow, I feel like I've seen this before, the good news is you probably have. So we'll just make up an example here. Nothing very sophisticated. Uh, z plus sine of z equals x times y. So this is an implicit relationship if I'm talking about it from the perspective of z. And what I mean by that is if you tell me what x and y are, that gives me some pretty strong restrictions on what, what z can be. Um, so z does depend on x and y. And I think it's the case that for this particular one, z is uniquely determined by x and y, but you're not going to find an explicit function that, that gives it to you. So the goal is, let's find <coughs> partial z, partial x, and partial z, partial y. So how do we approach this problem? Well, the key here is to think about what's in your mind. So we're going to switch colors. So the next color is what you're thinking about in your mind. And here's what you do. You say, I know that z depends on x and y. I don't know how. But I'll say that there's some function out there. And I'll call it z of x, y. And I'm going to really, when I look at this, I'm really going to write it in the following way. z of x, y plus sine of z of x, y is x, y. Now, again, this is in your mind. You don't have to actually write it out. But this sort of helps emphasize what's going on. Now, as I go through here and I take my derivatives, what do I do? Well, let's talk about these derivatives. You'll notice partial z partial x. So you should read it as the derivative of z, is what the top says. And downstairs it says with respect to x. So this says take a derivative with respect to x. So when we take the derivative with respect to x, what's going to happen is I'm going to say, where do the x's occur? Well, there's the obvious x, which is the x and the x times y. But then there's sort of the buried x, which doesn't necessarily show up in the original equation because it's inside the z function when we suppress the notation. So if you come up here, you might say, oh, there's only one single x. But remember, it's actually also inside of z. So we go through and take the derivatives. And what do we end up with? Well, we have the derivative of z with respect to x is the derivative of z with respect to x. That's not so hard. How about the next term, sine of z? Well, the derivative of sine is cosine of z times the root of the inside. And I'm taking the derivative with respect to x, and the derivative of z with respect to x is the derivative of z with respect to x. Equals, now I take the derivative of the right-hand side, which is x times y. And the derivative of x times y with respect to x is y. Because here, I'm thinking of y as a constant. Now you might say, shouldn't I also think of y as somehow depending on something? But when we talk about these implicit relationships, what we like to say is, look, two things are allowed to vary. And hence, we call these things variables. One of them is a dependent. So x and y are allowed to vary. Z is dependent. And when we say x and y are allowed to vary, that means they don't rely on each other. So there is no, as x changes, y doesn't do anything. It's a constant. So now that's not quite our answer, but that's how we start. And what's left, well, in this case, it's set up pretty nicely for us to finish. We say, hey, notice that on the left-hand side, I have terms with partial z, partial x, and I factored that out. And you'll always be able to do this. So if you can't factor out a partial z, partial x out of some terms, something wrong has happened. So you should always be able to factor out a partial z, partial x. Now, it might be you have to move stuff to the other side, but you should always be able to factor. That equals y. So the conclusion is partial z, 
partial x is y over 1 plus cosine of z. So that tells me if I want to know how z changes with respect to x, and I happen to know the current values of x, y, and z, I can put them all together. Now, in the interest of time, I won't go through it, but if you did the same thing with respect to y, almost nothing changes. Indeed, the only thing that changes is it becomes partial y's, on the other side it becomes x, and so if you work it out, you'll get that partial z partial x is x over 1 plus cosine of z. But the, the key for implicit differentiation is always just say in the back of your head, that variable z, and it doesn't have to be z, it just depends on the problem, and be ready because sometimes we change symbols. But changing symbols, it doesn't change anything, it's just, just names. But the point is that one of the variables depends on the other. And so if you can't remember, just write it out the long way and say, oh yeah, that's right. Now I take derivatives with respect to my other variables, and then I clean up and rearrange. All right. Uh, if you go through and, and watch the lecture from last time, we actually did some at the very end. I actually recorded a little bit more. So you can learn even more, which is great. So what's today's topic? Well, today is a really important topic. And uh, I know I say that a lot because calculus is really important. But today's topic is truly very important because we want to sort of say, what is the right idea to generalize the derivative? So if you think about single variable calculus, you say, well, you know, I have this thing called the tangent line. And there was this, this term, f prime of a, played a really important part of the tangent line. In particular, f prime of a was the slope of the tangent line. <coughs> so somehow the derivative was the slope of the tangent line. What we want to get to is to say, well, what's the right idea for the derivative now? Well, we're not doing tangent lines. We're doing tangent planes. So it makes sense to say, well, let's look at a tangent plane. So we went through, and we did this last time, what does a tangent plane look like? Well, it's z minus f of ab is our f sub x. That's just shorthand notation for partial f, partial x at ab times x minus a. f sub y at ab, which is, again, shorthand notation for partial f, partial y at ab times y minus b. Let me pause for just a second. A word of warning. I've taught calculus 3 for a while. And inevitably, when people are finding tangent planes, they forget to do one important thing. Notice that this partial f, partial x, is evaluated at a, b. And similarly for partial f, partial y. So don't forget, when you're looking for tangent planes, you need to evaluate those partial derivatives. If you don't, they're not tangent planes. And your person grading is going to be like, ah, 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 you know. It, it takes a lot to grade an exam sometimes. All right. So now, the, the question is, how do we think of it? What's the right thing for derivative? So what's this corresponding thing for f prime of a? Well, here's the idea is to say, maybe we can write this in a more interesting way. And here's how we rewrite it. We rewrite our tangent plane by the use of dot product. So it's our f sub x comma f sub y is the first vector. x minus a, y minus b is our second vector. And we're going to call this first vector, we're going to give it a name. We call it upside down triangle f at x, y. Well, no, not quite. And whoops, I already have a typo. This is upside down triangle, not at x, y. It's upside down triangle at a, b. All right. We'll fix that in post-production. OK, so if I rewrite that, that right-hand side as a dot product, you say, ah, in some sense, it, it really does match now. x minus a is talking about your differences, how you've changed. So when we're talking about differences in multivariable, we really should be a vector. And that's what we're talking about, x minus a and y minus b. That says, how have you changed in your coordinates? So this term. That is going to be what should be the derivative. Okay, so 
we're going to talk about that. And it has a name, it's called the gradient vector. And it consists of all the partial derivatives, and that's, that's it. That's what the gradient vector is. It's the collection of all the partial derivatives. And when you say, okay, well that's not so hard. Uh, is it useful? And over the course of the next two lectures, we're going to try to convince you, yes, it's very useful. So much so that a lot of what we do is based on, on the gradient. And uh, because it, it does act like the derivative. Now, this was the gradient for a two-variable function, partial f, partial x, partial f, partial y. It doesn't matter how many variables you have. So, for example, if I have a three-variable function, the gradient of g and g as a function of x, y, and z, it's partial g, partial x, partial g, partial y, partial g, partial z. The moral is the gradient is the collection of partial derivatives. And it's helping us to understand how things are changing. All right, well, what can you say? Um, a couple of, of notational things. So, if you look at this symbol, it does look like an upside down triangle. Uh, we don't call it upside down triangle because that doesn't make us sound very serious. So we want to call it something else. You'll hear it referred to as two different things. Most of the time, you'll hear it referred to as del. So it's called the del operator. We'll talk about what that means in the last part of the course. It's also referred to as nabla. Does anybody know where the word nabla comes from? Well, nabla is referring to a Greek harp. So if you looked at Greek harps, they actually look like, if you look at the, the case, they look like an upside down triangle with strings in them. And so nabla is referring to that. Okay. And there's sort of a preview of things to come, which says one way to think about this gradient is to actually think of it as though you're scaling this vector, del, by f. So it's like I have these partial derivatives and I scale it by f and thus I get the gradient vector. And you might say, ah, that's interesting. What would happen if you did other things with this del vector? Good questions. Third part of the course. We'll get to there. Now, a few very simple properties of the gradient. None of these should come as a surprise because what's happening is that we're dealing with vectors which break apart in a nice linear way and we're dealing with derivatives which are nice and linear. And so, in particular, things like if I add two functions together and I take their gradient, it's the equivalent to just taking the gradient of each individual function and adding the results. If I'm multiplying by a constant and I want to take the gradient, I can bring the constant out. These are the same things that we do with derivatives. And again, it's because really the gradient is acting like a derivative. So you should say, hey, you look like a derivative. Make a, give it derivative type rules. If I'm taking the gradient of a product, gradient of f times g, f gradient of g plus gradient of f times g what you would expect. And the last one, uh, think a little bit about what's going on here. So I'm taking the gradient of f of g of x, y. So if you look at this for a second, before we read the right hand side, notice that f has a single input and I'm plugging in g of x, y. So what's happening is I have a multivariable function called g and I'm plugging that into a single variable function called f. And I'm taking the gradient, which again, think of it as I'm trying to take the derivative. So what's the intuition? Well, if you think about what the chain rule says, you should say, take the derivative of the outside. So that would be f prime. Leave the inside alone, g of x, y. And then you multiply by the derivative of the inside. Well, the derivative for multivariable is the gradient. So we multiply it by the gradient of g of x, y. All right. Are you convinced? Do you want to see a proof of one of these? Proofs are not too surprising. They're all very straightforward. It's basically write it down. And it's like, oh, it works. Wow. Okay, let's do some practice then. 
We'll do some practice. Okay, we're going to do a bunch of practice, actually. Because they're all fairly straightforward ideas. Okay, so, find the gradient of f for f of xy is sine of x times y minus x cubed plus xy. Now, these are almost like one-line problems. Well, don't worry, we're going to have lots of good stuff for the gradient to do later on. So the gradient of f is going to be a vector. So oftentimes when we talk about the gradient, we'll often use the word the gradient vector. Because it is a vector, and that vector has meaning. We'll talk about the meaning of the vector in the next lecture. So our gradient vector. So it's the collection of partial derivatives. So which partial derivative should we do first? X. OK. Well, what's the derivative of sine of xy with respect to x? Yeah, y cosine of xy. Good. Derivative of x cubed with respect to x? 3x squared. Derivative of x times y with respect to x? Y. Good. I didn't even joke about y. Wow. That must mean it's a serious lecture today. OK. Now, next derivative will be with respect to what? Y. Good. Again, no joke. Derivative of sine of xy with respect to y is? Cosine. Yeah, good. X cosine xy. Because here, the x, now that's acting like the constant. The y is acting like the variable. Derivative of x cubed with respect to y? Zero. Derivative of x times y with respect to y? X. All right. And now, what do you do? Yeah. Box it. You're done. Finished. No more need for work. OK. Well, that was quick. So that's good news is we have plenty more. Find the gradient of g, where g of x, y, z is x squared z plus log of 1 plus z squared. All right. Now this is a, a function of three variables. OK. So gradient of g, what will go first? <coughs> well, derivative with respect to x. What's derivative with respect to x? 2xz. 2xz. Uh, what about the log of 1 plus z squared with respect to x? 0. Zero. OK. Now, what's the, derivative, what's the next term going to be? Zero. Derivative with respect to y, which is 0. Now, do I need to include the 0? Yes. yes. You do need to include the 0. You might say, but it's 0. It's important. It's a placeholder. You need to keep track. So even if an entry is 0, you've got to keep it there. Good. All right. Next term. x squared will be the first entry. OK. Derivative x squared z with respect to z is x squared. Anything else? 2z over 1 plus z squared. Good. Now, I will say that's the answer. Some people might want to write it in the following way. Namely, instead of component form, 2xz times i plus x squared plus 2z over 1 plus z squared times k. Both are correct. It's just a matter of which one do you like. I tend to put things into component form, but if you prefer things with i's, j's, and k's, you can write them as, in terms of i's, j's, and k's. Just make sure you're comfortable going back and forth. All right. Now, the next problem uh, says find the gradient of h for h of z, u, and p, which is z squared u plus sine of p e to the u plus z of p squared. Now, the point of this problem is that, well, really, there, there's two points here, two reasons why I like to put this problem on. First off is to say the variable names don't have to be x and y or x and y and z. You can make them anything. It's OK. That's the first point. The second point, or the second reason why I like to write this problem is because I get to say, huzzah up. So anyways. 
You know, that's why I like this problem. All right. So, but how do we talk about the gradient? Well, let's talk about what the gradient will be. If I write the gradient of h, what partial derivative will I have? What will be my first partial derivative? With respect to z. What will be my second one? U. What will be my third one? P. And the, the way you figure this out is you look at what does h tell you? Because h says I have three different inputs. And follow the order of the inputs. That's the convention. Follow the order of the inputs. All right. So, other than that, shouldn't have too many surprises. Okay. So partial h, partial z. What do I put down? 2zu. Anything else? Plus what? P squared. P squared. Good. Okay. Comma. Partial h, partial u. What do I put down? Z squared. Z squared, because there's a, there's a u there. Anything else? Sine of p, e to the u. Anything else? No, because there's no u on the last term. Okay, last entry. Partial h, partial p. What goes down? Yeah, e to the u cosine p. Good. Plus 2pz. Done. Done. Okay, good. You're getting the hang of it. All right. Well, one more. Now we'll make one up. Okay. So let's make one up. What function do you want to do? E to the XYZ. E to the X. Oh, you said E to the XYZ. Do you want XYZ all together in the exponent? All together. All together now. Okay. What else do you want? <laughs> Two. And then there was XYZ. Let's not make it perfectly symmetrical. Let's give it a little bit of flavor. And we already have the two, so that's a little bit of flavor. So uh, uh, we can do that. X to the YZ, sure, why not? Is that confusing enough? Okay, all right, all right. Gradient of G, what will it be? Well, how many entries will I have? Three, because that's a function of three variables. What's the first entry going to be? It'd be YZ, E to the XYZ. Plus, there's a 2, yz x to the yz minus 1. Now, why is it yz x to the yz minus 1? I'm taking it with respect to x, so I think this as x to a number. In this case, the number is called yz, but it's okay. I I, as I'm taking it with respect to x, y and z, I, I treat it like numbers. So the derivative of a x to a power, I know how to do that. Comma, and I suspect I'll need to go to a new line. Okay, derivative with respect to y will be xz e to the xyz plus 2 Well, it's x to the yz ln of x. Is that correct? Well, you need a z. Now, if you don't like the z there, you can also put the z there. Why do you need the z? Well, you can think of x to the yz. When I'm taking it with respect to y, I can think of it as x to the z to the y. 
and then it's the derivative of, of something to the y power is the something to the y power log of the something. So in that case, log of x to the z. All right, the last entry, probably this one would be pretty quick, given the second entry, will be what? x, y, e to the x, y, z, plus 2 x to the y, z, log of x to the y. Okay, there you go. See, that's not so bad. That's not bad at all. Okay, well that's the gradient. We're going to come back to that in a few minutes. But first we're going to ask ourselves the following questions, which is, let's think about how we can think of our partial derivatives. So, right now we've talked about two partial derivatives, because there are basically just two. I'm thinking of here as f is a function of x and y. And I have this partial f partial x and partial f partial y. Now when we say the words partial f partial y, it's really shorthand notation for saying the derivative of f with respect to x, or the derivative of f with respect to y, which again is shorthand for saying how is my function f changing as I change my input for x? So that's what, what this is saying. Partial f, partial x is how the function f changes as I'm changing x. Now one way to say I'm changing x is I can think of it as I'm in the, the plane. So maybe I should actually draw a picture here. So here I'm, I'm, I'm in my plane. I'm at a particular point, And let's say this is my point. And my plane is the input. So now there's a, there's a surface that lies over my input. And I'm at that point. And the question is, as I move in the positive x direction, I think it's that way, what's happening to the function? Am I going up? Am I going down? Am I not doing anything? So partial f partial x says, starting from that point, if I were to start moving in this direction as for my inputs, how is the function changing? Is it increasing? Is it decreasing? Is it staying the same? Similarly, partial f partial y says, well, what happens if I move in the positive y direction? Is my function increasing? Is it decreasing? Is it staying the same? Or is it so light we can barely see it? All right. Well, that's the two partial derivatives. But maybe we want to move in a slightly different way. Maybe we want to move at an angle. Okay, so that's our goal. The question is, what's happening? What's the directional derivative? So a different way to think about it, so this is sort of the picture of in the plane, in the domain. Sort of the, the analogous thing to think about, and uh, now is is uh, when I'll feel bad that I, I made so much fun of those art history people. So imagine <laughs> that you were, you were standing somewhere and very skinny legs, uh, but you're standing on a hill. Okay, so what you can say is, well, if I move in this direction, that's partial f partial x, that's the slope when I move in that direction. Partial f, partial y, well that's if I were to move in that direction, but maybe on this particular hill, I want to move not in, in east or north, I want to move at some other direction. How steep is it? That's what we're really after. How steep is it, that surface that we're on? So the, to answer that, we're going to do what are called directional derivatives. So if you, if you think about what's happening here, Let's start with the f sub x and f sub y, then we'll, we'll say what the general case is. So if I look at f sub x, I'm at a point p, how do I think of it? Well, what I do is I compare the value of the function at the point p plus a small change in the x direction. That's what this hi stands for. It's not saying hello, it's saying move a little bit in the positive x direction. Compare that function to where you're currently at, divide by h. Partial f, partial y, similar thing, says 
start at your point and then move a little bit in the positive y direction compare it to where you're currently at so that's the upstairs and divide by how much you moved and that will give you your answer so the general formula says the following if I want to know the directional derivative how much I'm changing in the direction of u well of my function at my point P it says the following start at your point P move a little bit in the direction of u so that's where the huh comes from that HU this piece here says move a little bit in the direction of u compare it to where you're currently at so you're looking at the difference divide by H and that tells you how steep you are how fast you would be moving if you were to go in that direction okay so notation everything has a meaning the D stands for directional derivative if you see a capital D about the only thing that means is directional derivative the U is the direction and this is a, a callback to say when you want to represent directions with vectors we use unit vectors because for a unit vector the length is automatically one so the only thing that that tells you about the vector is the direction so so if you know the vector uh, you know the direction if you know the direction you know the vector f is the function that you're looking at p is your current point so that you can read off all the information that you need okay well let's uh, try this let's find the directional derivative at 0 0 where f of x y is the square root of the absolute value of x absolute value of y and u is cosine theta sine theta now you might remember this function this is one that kind of vaguely resembles the Sydney Opera House in that this one was one that, that was not flat at 0 0 but we're going to take directional derivatives okay so how do you do it well the answer is you follow the formula so the directional derivative at 0 0 is going to be so I'm coming over here it's the limit as h goes to 0 from above of f of p plus h times u so when I say p plus h times u my point p is at 0 0 and I'm moving a little bit in this direction so it's going to be 0 plus h cosine theta and 0 plus h sine theta so that's my p plus h u subtract f of 0 0 all over h all right that's just the definition I haven't done anything too surprising so this is the limit as h goes to 0 from above and then I'll have the square root of h cosine theta h sine theta minus 0 over h well what can I do and I should say there are absolute values in the inside what can I do with the h yeah I have h squared inside the square root and I can pull outside of the square root and the square root of h squared is what h well good somebody caught it it's the absolute value of h but what do we know about h it's positive see that that plus you might have said wait a second why did you put a plus here in the definition because I needed it for this example but actually they're, they're really what the plus means says look if I want to know what's happening in that direction I only move forward I don't care what happens behind me so h negative is what happens behind me no no forward forward okay so you can pull an h out and then you can cancel an h so it becomes the limit as h goes to zero from above of the square root of cosine theta sine theta where there's an absolute value inside the square root you'll notice the limit of this as h goes to zero is very easy because there's no more h and so it becomes simply the square root of absolute value cosine theta sine theta which says that yes that particular shape is not flat at zero zero but if I'm standing at zero zero I can look at the slope in any direction I want 
and I can move in any direction and I can talk about how steep is it. So that's a perfectly fair question to ask. How steep is it to move from the origin at that point? Perfectly fine. All right. Well, so we have a definition, but there is a, a limitation to this definition. You might have noticed something. It has one of these things that are called limits. And if it's one thing we know, it's hard to do limits sometimes. So our goal is, let's do it without doing limits. All right. So the next step is how do we get rid of the limits? Hmm. So let's get ready for that. And here's the idea. We're going to work with a nice function. And in particular, we're going to say, let's suppose I focus on things which are differentiable. Now, what does differentiable mean? Differentiable says, locally I'm flat. So not every function is differentiable. And it's possible to still have, have these directional derivatives even if you're not differentiable. That's what the last example showed. But for most of the functions that we encounter, they are nice. They're very flat. We like flat things. All right, so we're going to start with that. So because our function is differentiable, we come back to what we said. Our function is differentiable, so f of xy minus f of ab is approximately partial f partial x at ab times x minus a plus partial f partial y at ab times y minus b. All right, well, so far, that's uh, pretty straightforward. So we look at our point. Our point is at a, b. Our unit vector I'll denote by s and t. So if I look at p plus h times u, that point where I just move a little bit in the direction of u, well, I'm just perturbing a and b. How? Well, a little bit a plus h s, b plus h t. So that's my nearby point. So now, what I'm going to do is this point, I'm going to plug it into x, y. So we have p plus h u minus f of p. Again, I'm plugging that in. What do we get? Well, partial f partial x at a, b. And then I say, well, what's the difference? Well, the change is exactly that h times s in the x direction. The change in the y direction is h times t. Well, that's good. Now what happens? Well, we go back to this idea of what we did at the beginning. Rewrite it as a dot product. Both terms have an h. Pull the h out. And then what you have is you have a partial f partial x, partial f partial y, dotted with s and t. Well, we have names for these things. Namely, we have h is h. The first thing, this partial f, partial x, a, b, partial f, partial y, a, b, that's the gradient at my point. And s, t, that's u. Ah, well, this makes it really nice. So when I look at my directional derivative, lo and behold, what happens? Well, look at the f plus f of p plus h, u minus f of p. It's basically h times the gradient of f dot u. Now, I say basically there's these squiggly lines. Squiggly lines are approximations. But how do you make a better approximation if you're on a tangent plane? What do you do? What? Limits. You take limits because tangent planes are better approximations the closer you get to your point of tangency. That's the idea. And so as h is getting smaller, the difference between that point P and P plus HU is getting smaller. And so we're going to have that our approximation in the limit becomes inequality. So the H's will cancel. We're left this gradient of F dot U. And therefore, important thing, the gradients help us find directional derivatives. And so we're going to get a lot of good stuff from that fact. OK, so some examples. Find the directional derivative for the following. 
f of xy is x squared plus 3x minus 5y squared plus 7y plus 11 pointing in the direction 3, negative 4 at the point 1, 1. Okay, well, again, our goal is not do it the long way, to say, hey, let's do the short way. First off, is this function differentiable? Yeah, polynomials are awesome functions. We love polynomials. The whole last third of the course in Calc 2 was like, polynomials are great. Everything gets a polynomial. You look like a polynomial. You look like a polynomial. Every function looks like a polynomial. Okay, so gradient of f. So if I'm taking it, I'm going to use my nice formula. Gradient of f, what is that going to be? 2x plus 3 in the first entry, comma, <coughs> negative 10y plus 7. Okay, there's, there's gradient of f. Now, I don't need gradient of f. I need gradient of f at 1, 1. Okay, so what does gradient of f at 1, 1 become? 5, negative 3. 2 plus 3, minus 10 plus 7. All right. So now I have the first piece, the grain of f, evaluated at my point. The next thing is I need u. Well, the question, they told me a, a direction, 3, negative 4. Is that the right thing for you? It's the right direction. Is it the right vector? Now, the, the thing is, I know it's the right direction because it says in the direction. So I know it's the right direction. If I want to use u, what, what kind of vector does it need to be? Unit vector. Okay, is this a unit vector? No, not yet. But we have ways. And the ways to make a unit vector is divide by the magnitude. So divide by the magnitude of the vector, 3, negative 4. So take any vector you want. You can make it a unit vector. You take the vector, divide by its magnitude. Well, almost any vector, the zero vector never has a direction. Okay, so what's the magnitude of 3, negative 4? It'll be 5, because you get square root of 9 plus 16, or square root of 25, which is 5. So this is, I can write it, I can even put the 5 on the inside. 3 fifths, negative 4 fifths. Okay, so that's my u. And so now, I can say that the directional derivative of my function at my point is the gradient of f, 1, 1, dot u, which will be 5, negative 3, that's my gradient, dot 3 fifths, negative 4 fifths. Well, what do you get? 5 times 3 fifths gives us 3. Negative 3 times negative 4 fifths gives us 12 fifths, and that's fine, but we can also say 3 is 15 fifths. 15 plus 12 gives us 27. 27 fifths. All right. So that's not so bad. Now, I'll say we put all our energy here as just functions of two variables. It turns out any number of variables work. So functions of three variables, functions of four variables, so forth and so on. For our class, we basically only worry about two and three. So now suppose we have the following question. Here is another function, g of x, y, z, x, z plus 5, y squared minus 6, z plus y, z plus 31. Find the rate of change of g at the point 1, 1, 1 in the direction of the point 3, 0, negative 1. Okay, now notice it doesn't say the word directional derivative. What are some clues that this is a directional derivative problem? Or maybe I should ask, is this a directional derivative problem? Yes, it is. The clue for that was, we just talked about directional derivative, and we haven't changed gears yet. Okay, so, but what are some clues in the problem that it's directional derivative? Okay, rate of change is secret code for derivative. What's the other clue? Direction. So it's like, there's this thing that means derivative, and there's this thing that means direction. Directional derivative. Okay, good. Now that we cracked that code, okay, next thing is to sort of say, okay, what do we need? 
Well, our now, our mindset is if I need a directional derivative, I need to do the gradient and I need to find the vector. So let's do the gradient really quickly. Gradient of g is, so derivative with respect to x will give us z in the first entry. Anything else? I, I think that's only x, right? Okay, next term. Uh, 10y plus z. Next term. x minus 6 plus y. Okay. And the 31 just goes away. All right. Did I, did I make a mistake? I think I'm okay. I think I'm okay. I hope. All right. Now, I need the gradient at my point, 1, 1, 1. You might say, why do you keep picking 1, 1, 1? Well, what's nice about 1, 1, 1? It's easy to evaluate. Okay. What do you end up with? 1, 11, negative, negative 4. Good. Now, what's our vector u? Well, they don't give us a vector. They said, we're at the point, 1, 1, 1. We want to go in the direction of the point, 3, 0, negative 1. So if we were to sketch this, here's 1, 1, 1. And here's 3, 0, negative 1. You're like, wow, that was really fast. What's your secret? The secret is, I wasn't trying to be precise. I just made it up. I'm looking for intuition. OK. So the intuition says, I want to go between the two points. So what's the vector between these two points? 2, negative 1, negative 2. Yes? So that's the right direction. Is that what you should be? No. What's wrong with this vector? Not a unit vector. So divide by the length. All right. What's the magnitude of 2, negative 1, 2? It turns out it's 3. It's square root of 4 plus 1 plus 4. Square root of 9 is 3. So this becomes 2 thirds, negative 1 third, negative 2 thirds. Now, by the way, if you don't like that, you could have just said, look, it's 1 third times 2, negative 1, negative 2. The, either way works. And we're almost done with this one. So the directional derivative is going to be 1, 11, negative 4, dot, 1 third, 2, minus 1, minus 2. Well, I can pull the 1 third out. And I get 2 times 1, which is 2, minus 11, and then plus 8. Which all together becomes negative one third. All right. Well, we have time at least for me to read the next problem, and I'll write the solutions up. This came from a recent exam. So these are the types of problems we really like. So suppose f is a differential function, and at a particular point, 1, 1, the directional derivative towards some point is 8, and the directional derivative towards some other point is 1. Find f sub x at 1, 1 and f sub y at 1, 1. Well, we have 30 seconds. We at least can sort of say, huh? What is this saying? Well, what's the point? The point here is, is to find these, fx and fy, you're really looking for the gradient, because they're, they're the entries of the gradient. So it's like, OK, so I'm really looking for the entries of the gradient. What do they give us? Well. They gave us the directional derivatives, which are a gradient dot a vector. So what they've given us is they've given us two equations. A, the gradient, which is unknown, dot one vector equals some number. Gradient, which is, again, the unknown, dot some other vector equals some other number. Well, that's two equations. And two unknowns you can solve. All right, that's it. I'll write up the solutions. See you next time.